Good morning. Welcome to our first circus seminar of the semester and the year for that matter. I'm thrilled to see everyone here. I hope you will be active, lively participants of circus this year. And I'm super excited to introduce our first speaker of the semester. So I only met Neil a few weeks ago. And after talking with him, I, I usually like to think of myself as having a pretty broad range of research interests. And then I met Neil. Now, I normally wouldn't read like, all the degrees people have, except that I think there's something really, really special about the breath that Neil brings to us that is perhaps something we all strive towards in this community. So, so he holds BAs in both physics and economics and international development from Queen's University. Then he picked up a master's in economics from the London School of Economics, followed by master's degrees in computer science and um, statistics from UC Berkeley. I'm guessing while he was en route to his PhD in business and public policy at the Berkeley Business School. So you might think that he's really not broad, he just likes to spend a lot of time in school. But no, no, no. Before becoming a professor at MIT Sloan School, where he is now, he has held jobs at a fairly diverse collection of places. My favorite of which is Canadian Parliament, United Nations, World Bank, Lawrence Livermore National Labs, and Bain and Company. So he's kind of like done it all, and I am in a little bit of awe, I must say. So um, as co-director of the X-Lab, which is an experimental lab at MIT that tries to do randomized trials to answer real live business questions, he sort of spans this wonderful spectrum of technology that is in the service of society, which seemed like an institution that I had heard of. And so he seemed like the ideal speaker to kick us off this year. And so I'm just thrilled to um, welcome Neil to join us. Well, well, thank you. You were very successful in embarrassing me. That's it. <laughs> Uh, so thank you so much for having me here. It's, I'm sort of I'm newly affiliated with Circus, and it was sort of it was one of those things where as soon as I read what you did here, I thought yes, I want to be more involved with those people. And so um, I'm really I'm very excited to be here. And actually, I'm, if it's all right, I will spend a little bit of time at the front of my talk, just giving you a little bit more of an introduction to my research, because I, I would really you know I'd like to make the connections with this group, and I'd like you to know a little bit more about who I am, so that hopefully as time goes on, you can say ah you know. I, I should talk with Neil about that, or you know, hey, I, I have this project. Maybe some of the stuff that Neil did could be helpful with it. So, um, so let me do that. And broadly, you can divide my research. So I, I work. I have about uh, sort of ten or twelve research products going right now across these four different areas. Um, so Moore's law and computer performance is really about sort of actually. What kind of performance are we getting from computers? How is that getting better or not? And what economic effects does that have? And you know, as you can imagine, given the, the scope of my background, I'm really interested in both sides of that. Tools and innovation is really around, OK, we have for you know, basically all of human history used tools to become more efficient and to innovate in better ways. And so what I'm gonna, I'll, I'll actually give you some examples from this. Um, but this is something where I, I think it's very interesting to think about the productivity of our, our scientists, for example. Uh, patenting and licensing, you can see now the crossover, sort of embedding this technology into economic institutions. And then finally, um, executing on innovation and strategy. I, for this audience, I will probably skip over some of this work, because uh, I think you'll probably be more interested on the science side of things. Um, but if anyone's interested afterwards, please come up and ask me. All right, so I'll start with these two, and then I'll spend a little bit more time on this one, just giving you a, a bit of background here. So in tools and innovation, I have basically three projects going on here. So the first one is around CRISPR gene editing. And some of you may heard of this. This is sort of widely expected to win one of the upcoming Nobel Prizes. And it's a way to cut and paste genes. And it's, traditionally, we've had really terrible tools for doing that. I mean, I mean terrible in, I mean, in the sense of like just a, a ton of work and very hard to use. I mean, you know, still very powerful. But CRISPR has really revolutionized that. And so what we've looked at in this project is we've looked at, well, who actually adopts CRISPR? And what are the factors that matter to that? And so one of the things you might know, for example, is that CRISPR was developed in uh, Berkeley and here in Cambridge. And well, it was enormously impactful. But um, and you, so if you look at people who adopt it, you see that there, people are, are more concentrated in those two areas. But what's neat about this project is we're able to break apart the people who try to use CRISPR versus the people who are successful at using CRISPR. 
And we see that actually being in Cambridge or Berkeley is just about whether you're sort of a good researcher or not. Like that, that being in Cambridge or Berkeley does not have a big impact on that. It does have a big impact on whether you're able to successfully convert trying to use CRISPR into actually doing it. So we have many more results there, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor of that. So it's about really about technology adoption. Um, another piece of technology adoption is around synthetic biology, and in particular gene synthesis. So this is the ability to write brand new sequences of DNA. Traditionally, we've been sort of limited to taking pieces of DNA and modifying them from nature. We now have this ability to write brand new sequences. And biologists have theorized for a long time that this would allow us to reach more broadly in the tree of life. So it turns out that even though sort of all of the organisms uh, that come from life basically speak the same language uh, of DNA, you can sort of think of them as speaking like different dialects, okay? For those of you who are biologists, you know, I'm talking about codon optimization or uh, codon usage. But it's this idea that if you take a part from something really very distant and try and bring it in, even though the, it won't, may recognize the DNA, it may just not work very well. And the nice thing with DNA synthesis is we're actually able to modify that to switch it from that other dialect into the native dialect. And we are, in fact, able to show in a paper that we're just submitting to Nature Biotech that, in fact, it is indeed the case that biologists are able to reach further in the tree of life. And this is just a very exciting thing, right? This means that the sort of diversity of life and all of the treasures that evolution has taken us down, we can now start accessing in a way that we couldn't before. Um, and then for this last one, I, I want to sort of start by giving you some facts, which I think are sort of first order facts about the world, but I actually didn't know until I started getting into this project in more detail. Okay, so the first fact is, if you look at the economic contribution that innovation in society provides, okay, so economists spend a lot of time thinking about this question, that is about, that's been pretty steady, okay? So if you look at over the last, say, 20 years, the contribution to economic growth from innovation, very steady. Okay, that, I mean, at least as a first pass, you might say, well, that's at least a little surprising, right? It sounds like we're always sort of hearing about all these cool things going on in innovation. That's interesting that, as a first order fact, a more worrisome fact is that the inputs to innovation have gone up dramatically. Okay, the number of people we have, the amount of funding that we use in science in total. Okay, so if our, our outputs are stable, but our inputs are rising, that's what that's telling us is that the productivity, sort of our innovation productivity, how much our innovation is leading to better economic outputs, is actually going down. There's declining innovation productivity. And that, for me, was just sort of a startling revelation, but it's very, I mean, it's very well documented. Okay, so what this piece of research is trying to do is to say, okay, if you have tool development, we know that tools make scientists more productive. If you have rapid enough tool development, could this happen that you could actually reverse this trend? And if so, what we would find is that, or, or what we would conclude is that we probably need a much more investment on the sort of basic tool side to make scientists more productive. And I, I mean, at least, you know, having gone around some labs, I do think that that's possible, right? I mean, you see lots of sort of first year graduate students who are doing stuff and you think, you know, I'm pretty sure a robot could be doing that. Um, you know, maybe better to focus the person on programming that robot or something like that. But, um, okay, so that's on the tools and innovation side. On the patenting and licensing side, um, the first one is, does licensing help or hinder the dissemination of science? So imagine you discover something, you know, really cool in, in academia and you have to make this decision, should I license this to a company or not? And there's a lot of fervor on both sides of this debate. Okay, so the people who are for it say, like, absolutely, we want to get this out in the world. Like, we actually want this to be part of the economy. We don't want to just have this ivory tower where we don't share anything. And the people on the opposite side who say, that's crazy. Like, those people out in industry, they're going to shut down on the sharing of information because they want to have some competitive advantage. Okay, so what we do in this piece of work is we look at those two things and we say, okay, let's actually look in practice at what happens to the tra trajectories of different pieces of research. And what we find is that for most things, actually it's really good. Like there's a slight increase in the amount of um, follow-on research that's done. It looks like getting it out to companies actually helps with one important exception, and that's research tools. Okay, and in particular, research tools that you actually have to like send to someone. So if you have a, like a particular genetic piece, 
right? And you actually have to send that, or you have like a m genetically modified mouse that's useful for testing whether, can whether some, uh, some drug is going to work against cancer, and you actually have to send that. Licensing those things has a big effect of chilling the scientific dissemination. Okay. Um, different strand of research here on, on the patenting and licensing. Does winning a patent race lead to more follow-on innovation? Okay, so fact about the world, for uh, about every 10th patent, about 10% of all patents, when they're filed, within the next 18-month window, someone else will be trying to file something that covers at least part of that innovation. Okay, so there is all of the time these races going on in technology to see who can develop things first. What we see when we look at this, is the question we want to ask is, well, how does that affect innovation? And, the, and, and so first of all, does it? I mean, there's some people who argue patents don't matter, everybody ignores patents. That is not true. You absolutely do see that when um, you lose this patent race and somebody else gets that patent coverage and you don't, you do less follow-on innovation. And also, you move the direction of the innovation that you do do. Okay. All right. And then lastly here, um, for patenting, there's this big discussion that goes on. So the idea that the economic institution exists at all is because we think it's going to promote innovation. Okay, great. We believe that that's true. We have almost no sense of the other side of this balance sheet. So how much are we paying? Like how much higher prices? Like we believe, certainly in like pharmaceutical, right, that we're paying much higher prices because of that patenting. There's good evidence of that when things go to generic. But still, you might wonder, well, for just a general patent, how much does that matter? And so as part of this uh, experimental innovation lab that uh, Mark was telling you about, um, I've actually started a, a, a randomized experiment where a company has agreed to abandon randomly some of their patent protection so that we can actually see how much does it change the demand for their products. Okay. All right. So that's these two streams of research. I want to turn now a little bit to the Moore's Law and um, computer, computing performance. Uh, so my, um, my PhD thesis was on um, how much does Moore's Law, and in particular for those of you who are into more of the details, how much did Denard scaling, when we lost that, when we lost this ability to make our computers faster, how much did that affect productivity? More recently, I've been doing some work with a number of people down at CSAIL, uh, at MIT's computer science group, on how do we get improved computer performance after Moore's Law. So this is uh, actually a paper that's in revision at science at the moment. Um, so the short answer that we've come to is performance engineering. Okay, that's a very broad term, right? So think about this as sort of customizing either the software you use or the algorithms you use or even the hardware that you use to better fit your problem. Okay, so let me give you a sense of some of the things that we conclude. So we have, have this nice illustrative example, which I think gets to a lot of what we're trying to say about the paper. So let's take an example of multiplying two 4,000 by 4,000 matrices. Okay, so if you, if you were to do this the way I would have done it before I did my uh, master's in computer science. You would say, well, what do I remember from linear algebra? And right, I remember that I sort of go along and I go down and I multiply them out. OK, that sounds like a triple nested loop. Great. I'm going to do that. And I would do, wouldn't have done it in a language that I would have been familiar with. So if you do that, do it in Python. 4,000 by 4,000 matrix takes about 25,000 seconds, about seven, seven hours. OK? That's, you know, that's a lot of time to wait for your matrices to multiply. Uh, OK, well, what if you just say, let, let's, let's not use quite an easy a language to program. Let's move down to either Java or C. All right, well, that's, that's pretty good. We've gotten a 47 times speed up just from switching those languages. Now, we've done a little more work. right? We've had to implement a little bit more. But OK, 47 times, that's pretty good. Now we can say, well, let's, let's start actually adjusting the algorithms we're using. Let's start customizing this code so that it's going to work specifically with the characteristics of the machine that we're working on. At the end, we can run it in under a second. OK? 62,000 times speed up. OK? So, OK, so, you know, I, I started this by saying, well, you know, where do we get computer performance after Moore's Law? Well, so the really good news about you know, this kind of exercise, and by the way, I, I mean, I, I want to caveat, because some of you might be saying, well, like, hey, wait a minute, in Python, there's a library where you can call something that does, you know, not all of this, but a fair bit of this. Um, that's true. I mean, the, the purpose of this illustration is to say, okay, like, when you do some of these things naively, you may be giving up a ton of performance, 
that if you invested more in, you could get. And that's in sort of what we're saying is this performance engineering is going to be very important. So the good news about the 62,000 is that if you compare that to Moore's law and how fast it progressed, 62,000 is many decades of Moore's law, right? So if we invest in this, we can still get computer performance improvements on the same order that we've been getting from Moore's law. That's the good news. Bad news is, you know, some of this has already been exhausted because we've done some of this before. Even more worrisome, I think, from an economic point of view, is that fewer benefit, right? When you modify this, right, you've made matrix multiplication faster. When you make chips run faster, you make everything run faster to first order, okay? So that, from an economic perspective, leads to a challenge. And it becomes, I would say, even more of a challenge when you get to the level of thinking about customizing to hardware. So here, you know, what we did is we took our code and we made it run on, uh, we made it use the features of an existing piece of hardware very well. If you had instead modified it to run on a GPU, you can get 360,000 X, okay? Another six X above what we got here. But now you're starting to get into more specialized hardware. And so another piece of research that I have going on right now is about hardware specialization, okay? So the good news is that hardware specialization is having a lot of benefits, right? And I mean, I think some people in this room probably are doing deep learning, which is really all about being able to use this spe specialized hardware. Um, but it's also gonna leave people behind. So what do I mean by this? Well, you know, if you think back to sort of AlexNet as the first example, um, customizing um, to go work on a GPU had incredible returns, right? I mean, you know, I, I can't remember the, the uh, you know, it's, I think it's tens of millions of parameters that this uh, particular convolutional neural net had. Okay, but that was on a GPU, and GPUs still, you know, I mean, much more specialized than a CPU, but still fairly general in terms of doing a lot of things. But of course, what's happened since then is people have said, well, you know, actually, a lot of those calculations on a GPU, I don't need that level of precision, I can actually customize it a little more. And so you have people like Google producing the TPU, the tensor processing unit, which is able to do it even more efficiently in a lot of cases. Okay, that's great, but now notice we're getting narrower and narrower at how much this, har who can benefit from this hardware, right? If you're not doing exactly this, it doesn't help you very much. And so from an economic perspective, what I and worried about is what happens to everyone else when the largest chip buyer is moved to specialized hardware, right? If you have these, like if you take sort of the space of all problems you want to solve and you have these little islands within it where people have invested a ton of money and developed incredibly specialized chips that don't help the people around them, right? That's a very different world than the world we've been living in where everybody has benefited from CPUs getting better, okay? And so what we're trying to think through is, well, what are going to be the consequences of that? Um, okay, so that's enough for the deep dives. A uh, few other pieces, just in case you happen to be interested. So in this research stream as well, I'm also doing a randomized experiment where we're uh, working with one of the stock exchanges where we're, um, the question is sort of how do high frequency traders use information? And if you give more information, does that help them or does that help other people um, counterbalance against them? And so we're doing a randomized trial where we're gonna provide some information about some stocks and not about other stocks. And we're gonna see actually how the stock market evolves be able to see how high-speed traders are using the information. So, okay. All right, so enough for the long intro. Um, let me get to, uh, hopefully while you're here today, um, showing you that science is shaped by Wikipedia. Um, so this is work with Doug Hanley at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and I wanna start here by just taking a step back from Wikipedia and just thinking about what I'll call informational public goods. Okay, so that's a very economics-y term. What does it mean? It means this idea of you sort of, you know, open access information where lots of people can benefit. And I mean, the nice thing about informational public goods is, you know, my using that information doesn't really harm you using that information or you using that information later on, which is different from what's often called the tragedy of the commons where, you know, you have something and you leave it open to the world, but as soon as someone grabs it, then the rest of us can't have. It. Okay, all right, so, you know, um, things, a lot of our scientific information is in fact embedded in journals, typically which are not open source, right? So, uh, for example, the Journal of the American Chemistry Society, which is probably one of the most prestigious chemistry journals. Um, if you are not part of a university that subscribes to this, it's going to cost you about 12 bucks an article to buy this. Now, okay, that's, you know, if you knew the article you wanted to buy, that's not too bad, right? You could, you could probably do that. 
But you can imagine the problem of, you know, when you first start getting into a literature, and you, just, you don't know. You don't know what's the right article to read. Then, you know, you could either spend thousands of dollars, or you probably are restricted from actually using this. Okay, so you might worry about that a little bit. Um, in contrast, there are things like the Human Genome Project. Right? So this was a major, major effort across many different academic centers, and much of that information was put online for people to share. Really, and it's been you know, incredibly valuable for scientists to be able to access that information. OK, great. So Wikipedia shares some of these characteristics and, and some not. Right? So I mean, the nice thing is it's definitely open. Okay, but it's not quite as technical. Like this, you know, this is really data sharing at some level, and this is, these tend to be more technical areas. But there might still be some effect on scientists, right? In particular, Wikipedia is the fifth most accessed website in the world. Okay, you might think that there would be some impact there, and it's more general those articles. But you know, quoting no one, no one less than Charles Darwin, right? He says, "I sometimes think that popular, the general and popular treatises are almost as important for the progress of science." as the original work. Okay. So, you know, this is certainly my experience that there, you know, some New York Times writes an article on something and that can still be incredibly impactful because it gets out to the world in a different way. Okay. All right. So the research question is does Wikipedia influence science? Okay, the answer we're going to have the first part which is going to be not surprising is that Wikipedia reflects science. Okay? Someone writes a new scientific article that's really important at some point later, someone's going to write a Wikipedia article that tells you about what that finding was. The more interesting thing is we're also going to be able to show you causally that Wikipedia actually shapes science. Okay, so you write something on Wikipedia and that changes the way that scientists talk about it in the academic literature. Okay. So um, let me make a comparison here. And I almost feel like this is, you know, it's almost to make the point that there really isn't a comparison here. Right? So we still talk about Wikipedia as an encyclopedia. But you know, if you go back to Britannica, right? You know, Wikipedia has 5.3 million articles. Britannica has 65,000, like two orders of magnitude, right? Fifth most visited website in the world, 2,000th most per month. 18 billion page view, 500 million unique visitors, right? Like this is a substantial fraction of humanity using Wikipedia every month. Okay, so I, I just I want to highlight just you know how important Wikipedia is in that sense. Um, it's also important in science. So if you um, actually sort of crawl down the tree, the category trees from different aspects of science, you can start counting, well, actually, how many articles on science are there in Wikipedia? Short answer is about half a million to a million. Okay? And as you can imagine, it sort of depends when you, when you want to um, prune your tree. right? Some, at some point, you go down from like chemistry to distilling to alcohol to the Scottish brewer. Right? And you're like, well, OK, I'm not sure that I, you know, I'm going to call that. Um, Glenn Livett, uh, an article on science. Um, so this is about 10 to 20 percent of all the Wikipedia pages. Okay? So that's, you know, first order. So this is a big repository of science. In fact, you can sort of quantify this even more. So but for comparison, there are about 90 million records of Web of Science, which is, you know, one of the major repositories of academic papers, which suggests that there's one Wikipedia article for about every 120 scientific journal articles. Okay, I, I had no idea. That's a, like when I started this project. That's a big contribution that they're making. Okay, what about the coverage of Wikipedia, though? So this is saying that there's, you know, there, there are a lot of actual things there. We might want to take it from the other side and start from science and say, well, how well is science covered by Wikipedia? Well, to do this, we did a sample of chemistry topics, so 646 undergraduate ones and 136 graduate topics. And we found these by going to the syllabuses of Harvard, MIT, Oxford, and I think three or four other places. And we just noted down all the things that they were talking about in their undergraduate syllabi and their graduate syllabi. We said, OK, let's, let's just go look those up on Wikipedia. How, are they covered? Very well, particularly at the undergraduate level. Okay? Better than 90% of all the topics in undergrad had articles on Wikipedia, and you know, reasonably well at the graduate level, about 40 or 50 percent. Okay, and so you know, in fact, one of the the um, things about this is that most of the content we're going to be adding is going to be at, at this level, because we use this exercise first of all to establish what what was going on here, but as you will see later, we're going to do an experiment where we're going to use these missing places, right? So places where we saw something on the syllabus that was not on Wikipedia, we're going to do that, and we're going to write some of those articles. And then we're going to actually put them on and see what happens. Okay, but we'll get there. Okay, so 
Science and Wikipedia is very well covered. That's great. Um, do scientists or you know, technical people actually use this information? Well, it turns out there actually was a paper on this. Uh, this is not, not my work, but by Hughes and all. And uh, they asked doctors. And they said, OK, you know, when you actually go and see someone, how, you know, what percentage of the time where you're seeing a patient do you actually go and just check Wikipedia to find, look something up? Look up medical information. Okay, not, not like, oh, you know, you know, is it going to be a long weekend? No, no, no. Like, to look up medical information on Wikipedia. 26% of all cases that they did, they looked up something on Wikipedia. Okay? That's a lot of looking up medical information by, by my medical specialist. <laughs> okay? Um, wow. And, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and what about in a week? I mean, this is, this is per visit. What, maybe there's just a small number of people that are looking it up. Not so much, actually. So sure, of doctors using this for medical information? In, in a week, 70%. Okay? 70% of doctors are looking something medical up on Wikipedia every week. All right. So, okay, there's lots of science on Wikipedia. People are using it for technical information, and it makes sense that they're using it. I mean, this is, you know, there are a huge number of these pages, fifth most vi visited website in the world. Okay. Uh, it turns out even if they're using it, though, they're not citing it. Okay. You look in the academic literature, and so someone actually looked this up, fewer than 0.01% of all articles cite Wikipedia. Okay. All right. you, you might have guessed that this was coming, right? Um, well, so why? Okay. So I think, you know, answer number one is probably embarrassment, right? <laughs> So you, you may remember this uh, BBC guy, an uh, expert on South Korea, whose kids uh, ran into the frame while he was doing it, right? So part of this is like, you know, you're an expert in the field. You're kind of like, well, I don't really want to say that I looked this up on Wikipedia. Okay, I'm not, you know, I understand that one. There's also a second thing, which is a little less sort of nefarious, which is just, it may, you may actually not think it's needed. Okay, so here we did Princeton's academic integrity statement. And it says, you know, if the fact or information is generally known and accepted, for example, that Woodrow Wilson served as president of both Princeton and the United States, or that Avogadro's number is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, you do not need to cite a source. Well, okay, what's, you know, how are you going to judge whether or not something is accepted? Well, one thing you might say is it's on an encyclopedia, right? That, that's kind of an accepted thing, right? So, okay, so that, like, I'm not, as I say, I'm not saying that this is nefarious, but it definitely means it's going to pose a challenge to us when we're looking for the effect of Wikipedia to understand what's going on here. Okay? All right. So our approach is going to be we're going to use the creation of a new Wikipedia article as a shock. Right? So you create that, and then we're going to look and see what happens in the academic literature afterwards. And to do that, we're going to use lexicographic, lexicographic measures. Okay? So we're actually going to look at the words that were in the Wikipedia article and the words that are in those scientific articles, and we'll do the analysis at the word level or at the document level in order to see this pattern. Okay. So data for this. This was uh, <laughs> a bit of a challenge in terms of data, um, and that's just because at one point when I said to uh, the IT group at MIT Sloan, I said, okay, well, I, you know, I want to download the full edit history of Wikipedia. They said, oh, yeah, how big is that? And I said, well, it's 20 terabytes. And they said, well, that's you know, a substantial fraction of our entire computing space for all of the professors. So why don't we see if we can figure out an alternative for that? Um, so anyway, we, we used, uh, there's a supercomputing cluster at MIT, so we use that, but yes. <laughs> um, OK, so we have the full edit history from 2001 on. So 353 million edits every word, 17.4 billion of them. As I say, 20 terabytes, or tebibytes, because this audience may appreciate that. <laughs> um, and then we're going to take, a, we're going to focus on a sample uh, of chemistry, which is going to make this a little bit more manageable. Um, we also have the Elsevier journals. So the Elsevier journals, uh, I have full text of every Elsevier journal ever published. Um, and again, we're going to take the sample of chemistry. We're going to pick the top 50 journals in Elsevier, which is going to compose 236,000 articles. Okay. So those, that's the comparison we're going to make. So first thing, let's like look at these additions of words to Wikipedia. So. This is the creation of new articles. And this blue line up here uh, is, is for all different articles in science, uh, excuse me, all different articles on Wikipedia. So you can see, you know, 10 to the 5 articles uh, being created. Okay, great. Um, this green line here is chemistry. 
And this red line down here is econometrics. So um, econometrics, for those of you who don't know, that's sort of the branch of statistics that economists use. And uh, full disclosure, we originally intended to do this as a two-armed uh, two -two trial. So we had chemistry, and then we were also going to do uh, econometrics. It turns out that this idea, you know, you can see that there's between one and two orders of magnitude less interest in econometrics than there is in chemistry. That turns out to be true more generally. So it turned out not to be a very helpful arm for the, to look at. Um, so anyway. Uh, OK, so that's monthly article editions, monthly word editions. You can see, you know, sort of 10 to the 8. So, you know, very, you know, a lot, lot of work going on here. OK. Uh, what about the words that are used in these two corpuses? Uh, so there's a fairly high correlation between them. You know, you can, you can really see that here. Um, and so here what we're looking at is the log frequency of those words in science, uh, of particular words in science, and the log frequency of the usage on Wikipedia. Okay. All right. So now let's think about how we're going to measure the effect of this. So, you know, we have some scientific literature, right, and we're going to sort of do a before versus after comparison. So we have the scientific literature before, and then a new article is going to be created in Wikipedia. Okay, it's great. So we're going to want to compare those two. And then afterwards, some more scientific literature is going to come out. Right? And we're going to sort of say, well, you know, does it, did it look like these articles were influenced by here? Right? Is there more similarity here? And so the way we're going to do that is by doing a similarity comparison. Right? So we're going to calculate the similarity between these articles at Wikipedia and those in, in liter scientific literature. And we'll do it the same thing to the literature afterwards. We also have to have a time frame for how we're going to do this. So we're going to pick a six-month period before the Wikipedia article was created and then a six-month period after, and then we're going to give a three-month period here for an article to be created. Okay? And the reason for that I'll, I'll explain in just a second, but it's about sort of the development of those Wikipedia articles. So I'll, I'll, let me tell you a little bit about this three months and then also about how we're going to calculate the similarity. So for this three months, the problem is stubs. Okay? So for those of you who use Wikipedia a lot, you may know this, but like when, if you look at when the magnesium sulfate article was first created, this was the content of the magnesium sulfate article. Magnesium sulfate and uh, magnesium SO4, commonly known as Epsom salt, is used as, as a therapeutic bath. That's a pretty unhelpful thing to look at, right? Because And what's happened is someone is just flagging, look, this is an, a topic that is worth talking about. Someone come along and start filling it in, right? It, it merits a Wikipedia article, now edit. Okay, so we don't want to use the, the fret first creation because in a lot of cases it's going to be these stubs. Okay, and so what you can see is that as people start to edit, you know, they come in and they say, okay, let, you know, let me add a couple more paragraphs about um, where it was originally found, it's prepared from seawater, yada, yada, and it starts to develop. And so we're giving that three-month period so that the Wikipedia article actually gets to a state where you can imagine it influencing the scientific literature, not like this first line where it would be almost impossible to pick up. Okay. All right, so that's, that's the, that three-month period. What about the similarity? So for the similarity, we're going to do two things. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to narrow the tokens to meaningful words. Okay? You can imagine why we'd do that, right? We don't want to be picking out the, of kind of thing. Um, and then we're going to calculate the cosine similarity between the scientific article and the Wikipedia article. So let me talk, talk you through those. Okay, so we're going to narrow to meaningful words. So the first thing we're going to do is our corpus is we're going to take the top 90% of words used in science. Okay, so why, you know, why limit ourselves to this? Well, first of all, it excludes the noise from words with single digit frequency. So a bunch of the stuff we're going to do, we're going to look at the change in the percentage usage of a word, right? If a word goes from, you know, one usage to eight usages, like it, it looks like an incredibly massive change, but like there's actually probably a lot of noise around that, so we don't really want to get our results based on that. Second thing it's going to do is it's going to exclude errors in parsing, non-content strings, and misspellings, right? And so this is just a function of, you know, we're doing this at a very big data level, and they're just, you know, in Wikipedia people do misspellings, in science people do misspellings. We just want to get rid of all of that so that we can focus on the words that have more actual scientific meaning. And then we're going to weight terms using term frequency, inverse document frequency, a T TF, IDF. Are people familiar with TF? Okay, okay, uh, okay, let me, so, I mean, the short version is you say, like, in any particular article, if a, you do, is a, if a word is used more, you're going to upweight it, okay? But you're going to say, well, I'm, I'm then going to downweight things by how many documents they're used in in the corpus. So if they're used in every single document, you're going to take that weight back down quite a bit. 
Whereas if it's an unusual word, if you use it a lot, but other people don't use it very much, that's going to be really important. Okay, and so that's, that's a way of saying, like, we're not going to be picking up here the uh, of, right? Because that's going to be downweighted by the inverse document frequency rate. Okay? All right. Okay, great. So now we, now we have, we're narrowed to meaningful words, and now we're going to do this cosine similarity stuff. So um, that's the sort of formula. Let me give you actually some intuition for it. Okay, so imagine we have two articles, and the first one has, you know, this meaningful word enzyme, and the se second article has the word reaction. And notice I've, I've bolded these two and not bolded the article before them because, of course, the inverse document weighting we just did is going to downweight those others. So the important part is here is going to be the word enzyme and the word reaction. And what you're going to do is you're going to build basically a set of dimensions where each dimension is one of these keywords. Okay? So if we had an article, article one comes in and it uses the word enzyme, but it does not use the word reaction, it gets... Uh, it gets, goes on this axis, right? And then we say, okay, well, what about reaction? Well, if we had another article that just used the word reaction and not enzyme, they're going to look like this. And so you'd calculate the uh, cosine of those two things at 90 degrees, and you're going to say, okay, they're not at all similar, which is what we would expect, right? Um, if you had a second article that was right similar to this, these two would have a, be a cosine of zero, so those are very similar, exactly as you'd expect. And if you had a third article that was about a reaction enzyme, then it would be somewhere in the middle here, and you could calculate the distance this way. Okay? Happy? Everyone happy with that? Because, yeah, okay. <laughs> so some nodding, some just looking. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so that's our cosine similarity. So we're now going to do two sets of estimations with these Wikipedia results. Okay? So the first thing we're going to do is the big data version. So we have the full edit history. Let's look at those instances where people created chemistry articles, and let's look at the scientific literature after it. Okay? Second thing we're going to do is we're going to do an experiment. So we're going to create some new articles, and we're going to add a random subset of them to Wikipedia. So big data approach first. Okay? So we're going to look at this. At every point, we're going to compare that Wikipedia article to the literature that came before and the literature that came after. And this is the kind of distribution of similarity that you're going to get. Okay, so this is, just, I, this is just descriptive to tell you, you know, there are a lot of articles with not much similarity, right? And that makes sense, right? They're not, not really on the same topic, right? And then there's a tail up here, and you can see it sort of, you know, peaks out at this sort of 0.3 to 0.4. Um, those are the articles that are pretty similar to the topic of the Wikipedia article. Okay. All right, so what happens when a new Wikipedia article is created? So here on the y-axis here, we have the change in the number of articles as a percentage of the ones that were in that bin beforehand. And here we have that document similarity. Right? And so this is why I wanted to show you that other one. So remember that that distribution looked like this. Right? And so what we're seeing is this upper tail of things that are very, very similar are getting to boost. So you know, at the 0.3 level of similarity, we have something like an 11 or 12% increase in the number of those articles coming after this Wikipedia article. Yeah? I just want to make sure I'm understanding what's going on. The Wikipedia articles you're talking about, these are ones you wrote, or these are ones that you just pulled from? Right, so we're still in the big data part of this. So this is still, this is just looking through the history of Wikipedia and saying, this was, cr this was created. I observed that that magnesium sulfate article was created. And I looked before and after, and I'm just, look, I'm just measuring. Like, if I just get, look at the similarity to the literature before and the similarity of the literature afterwards, did it get closer? So you don't know if there's causality between the Wikipedia article and the... Exactly, right. This big data approach is not going to be able to get us causality. Exactly. Okay, and, that, and that's, in fact, why we're going to do the experiment, because, that, I mean, the nice thing about this is we can do it on all chemistry articles. The bad news is, you know, exactly this question of correlation is going to be a real problem, right? We, we, can, get, we can get correlation, but not causation. Okay. But it is still telling, right? Like, we definitely see an effect here. And if you look in general across all of this, you see in a regression framework, you see that um, we get sort of 0.86% uh, increase across these articles. And that's highly statistically significant. OK. So coming to exactly to your point, I'm so glad you did. So this is a correlation. What explains it? Well, I would put forward, and certainly what I went into this thinking was, Right? that there's this idea of a common cause. Okay? So somebody writes a really clever article in chemistry. Okay? It's, you know, 
it's just one article of, of a whole group, right? That's not a, not a large representation. And so if you calculate the distance, OK, so this, this new article gets created, and it triggers a new Wikipedia article. And it also triggers a whole bunch of follow-on literature. OK, but it's, it's the scientific article that causes both of those things, not the Wikipedia article. But if we looked at it in the same framework we've been looking at it, you would conclude, well, we did get the same finding we had before, right? Because this sort of groundbreaking article here would have, some, would have a lot of similarity to the Wikipedia article, but it would be a small number of them, right? A small proportion of this. Whereas if it was influential, it would have a big effect over here, right? And so we would observe the same moving of the similarity towards. OK. That's not what, that's not what I'm trying to look at, right? I want to look at this path. I want to see the part that's actually causal. And so for that exactly, we're going to go to the experiment. OK. So the experimental design here is we're going to take that list. You remember I showed you we took that 646 undergraduate articles, 130-some uh, art, graduate articles, uh, graduate topics, looked them up on Wikipedia and said, OK, is this covered? A whole bunch of those not covered. We said, great. We went out, hired a whole bunch of PhD chemists. We said, hey, write some of these articles for us. Okay? And we had 43 new articles created. Okay? Now, um, now what we're going to do is we want, we're going to, from that, we're going to create a treatment group and a control group. Okay, the treatment group we're going to upload to Wikipedia. The control group we're not going to upload to Wikipedia. Okay? Now, oh, and, and by the way, just to, to point out, I mean, the reason we, it's going to be really important to do that, to have the articles written, even though we're not putting them up, is remember we're going to be doing all of this analysis on words. And so we need to actually have the article that we would have put up so that we can look at the words in that. Okay, so we'll get there, but um, okay, so we have all these newly created Wikipedia articles, and now we're going to stratify based on article, author, and topic type. Okay, so stratification, that's sort of a concept that comes from experiments, which you guys may or may not be familiar with, but it's this idea that when you do a randomized experiment, you may not want to just like say, you know, I take this room and then I say, okay, ran randomly half of you are going to be into treatment and half of you into control. I might want to make some division, right? I might want to say, well, I'm going to take all the professors and I'll divide you evenly and then I'll take all the students and I'll divide you evenly. And that's going to prevent something later on happening where my treatment group is like overrepresented with professors and underrepresented with students and what I'm getting as an effect is actually the effect of being a professor and not the effect of the treatment. Okay, so it's just a way of getting better covariate balance than you can get just randomly. Okay, so the two we're going to do this on are our article author. So we had a number of PhD students doing that doing this work, and you might worry that they have you know, different quality of background in terms of chemistry, they have different quality of writing, maybe some of them did sort of you know, better figures for people that made that more interesting. Okay, so we, we're going to stratify based on that. We're also going to do it on topic type. So in chemistry, you know, there's some things where it's like this is a really specific reaction, chemical reaction, and there's some which is like this is a chemical principle. And again, you might want those to be balanced as well. So we do that. We get 22 treatment articles, 21 control articles, and I will show you in a second, we get excellent covariate balance between them. So that's making sure that the treatment and the control group look very similar. And as I said, those treatment articles we upload to Wikipedia, and the control articles we do not. Okay. And this is just to show you how similar these, these groups of articles look like. So this is the number of words in those articles. You know, treatment 241 on average, control 243 number of links in those articles, number of figures, and you can see we're very close. So the only place that we really get any kind of imbalance is we just looked up the title of it in Wikipedia, oh, excuse me, in Google, and okay, there you get different numbers of hits, but of course, I mean, I don't, I don't really know what that means, but we, we did it just to see in any case. All right, so um, let's actually get to it. So this is an example of one of the new articles we created. Okay, so you can see it's, you know, like, when I first read the title, I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I can read this. I know something about free radicals, right? And then you get to free radicals can undergo elimination reactions to form olefins, a reaction known as an elimination reaction with blah, 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 and then disproportionation. And I was like, okay, well, no, I'm not a, chem I'm not a chemist, no. <laughs> um, right, so, so they've written this article, and you can see that we, you know, we did a good job of this. Like, there are three different uh, figures that we've added. You know, we're referencing the academic literature. Like these, these are proper articles that we created. It is amazing the sort of the scale of Wikipedia because you add these articles and you think, okay, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping some people will look at it. Uh, on average, on average, our articles got 4,400 views per month. Okay, yeah, please. Do you know how many of those are 
Uh, I think, as I recall, the site that we use to actually do this, I think, excludes them automatically. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, that, I think that must be true. Because <clears throat> as I said, when we, we did some of this testing, <clears throat> excuse me, with the econometrics articles, and we did not see this number. <laughs> yeah. Uh, OK. Hmm, excuse me. All right, so we have these new articles. Um, we can also do this, this document similarity. And one of the things you'll notice, remember before we were sort of capping out at this 0.3 to 0.4? We have more similarity here. So this is reflective of the fact that our articles are a little closer to that scientific frontier. Okay, and that, you know, that's, part of that is by design. These are gradu graduate topics, right, which is by necessity closer. Part of it is also just that you know, we actually had PhD chemists writing these articles and not random Wikipedians, and so it's probably more technical as well. All right. So now the experimental, right? This is the side where we get the causality. Big effect still. OK? So we see, as you would expect, there is some drop off in the low similarity. right? And that's reflective of the fact that like, you, ultimately this has to balance, right? There's, like, there's some percentage change on some denominator, but across all of these, like, we're, we're balancing on the total distribution. But what you can see here is this very interesting. So as soon as you get to these high similarities, you're getting these you know, 7, 10, you know, 15% effects. Right now, we should point out like these are, uh, these are two standard errors. Like There is, in fact, at the top here, there's some uncertainty because there's just not that many articles that are this close. Okay? But you can definitely see the statistical significance here. And again, it's highly statistically significant. Okay? We can also look at this not just by similarity, but just over across all the articles and we get a 0.3%. Again, highly statistically significant. OK, so first of all, yes, you write that Wikipedia article. Scientists are looking at those articles. They're reading the, they're reading the way you talk about it. And they are changing the way that they talk about it in the academic literature. OK. So let's come back then to our graph and say, well, you know, what, we, what we observed right, was a correlation. OK, yes, we definitely have that common cause, right? Our, our, the coefficient we just got is not as big as the original one, which suggests there's a lot of common cause. And thank goodness, because right, if we didn't find that, I'd be really worried, right? You believe that science is the, in, the ultimate engine behind this. But we also find a causal effect. And what I find just you know, incredibly interesting is that the size of the causal effect is about a third of the overall effect. So there is a huge impact. Like people are going to Wikipedia. Just, I mean, you know, it's not necessarily saying that they're like totally changing their research stream, right? This could just be like they think about how to relate it to the other words that are in the field, the other concepts that are in the field by reading that Wikipedia article, and that sort of puts a framework for them to think about it. Okay. So that we see that effect. I want to now turn to disaggregating that effect a little bit. And in particular, you know, I started, but one of the things I started by saying is this might be more important if you didn't have access to journals, right? If you couldn't pay that $12, right? Having this sort of general source of information about science could be really valuable. So let's take a, an approximation of this. So we're going to divide countries so we can see the country that um, uh, these scientific articles are coming from. We're going to divide them up into quartiles. So we're going to have the richest countries, Second quartile, third quartile, and this is the, you know, the poorest 25% of countries. Okay, so the first thing you can see is the number of scientific publications coming from these places is highly skewed. Right? Rich countries produce a lot of science. Very poor countries produce almost none. But our hypothesis might be that the poorer you are, the more this open source piece of information will be really helpful to you. And that's actually what we see. Okay, so we see that uh, up until the third quartile, we see that you know, there's very few articles at the fourth quartile, and we have big standard errors here. Um, but as you go from the first quartile to the second quartile to the third, these effects get bigger and bigger. Okay? And so you know, I think this is sort of a really good story for the world. Right? This says that when we write Wikipedia articles on science, we are really helping the whole world here, particularly people who just are disadvantaged. This is equity improving because we're giving people access to some of the science that they could not get to otherwise. Okay. All right, I, I want to take one more um, turn here before, uh, before I end. Um, and that is to say, OK, like I told you that Wikipedia influences science. How like, cost effective is this? Okay. And so I want to do a comparison here. 
Now, um, <laughs> this is going to be very rough. Like, yeah, please. Uh, a question on, on the, uh, the experiment. So um, I don't know much about chemistry research and how it operates. It strikes me that this um, three to six month time scale that you're looking at is, I mean, it's inconceivable for me to think about from areas that I you know, work in, of actually having an impact on the science that's done. And I wonder if you have thoughts on whether uh, we're seeing the effect either because uh, it's, it's really about just affecting the language that people choose to use um, that, that could happen on a short time scale. Or perhaps, you know, another thing that struck me was that looking at 50 Elsevier journals in, in chemistry, I think like if you did that in, in computer science, um, a very small number of those 50 would be really serious computer science uh, research journals. And, and we would start to get to some pretty low quality um, uh, publications, whether, you know, maybe in, in that sphere, somehow the, the, they're relying on Wikipedia more. So th those are two, you know, thoughts, questions. I'm, I'm curious where, what you think? Yeah, so let, let, let me take them in reverse order and try and, try and make sure I remember. So um, so I, I guess for the second one, I mean, I think there are two differences, I mean, at least two differences between computer science and this, right? So one is, I mean, you guys publish much more in conferences, and so, you know, we might look at the con top conference proceedings as a way to look at it comparable. There isn't that same sort of conference culture in chemistry, and so I, I think looking at the top journals is a pretty reasonable place to do it. Um, uh, it. Might there be some, like, I think the second point you were making is might there be a tale like the first top, 10 or 20 chemistry journal articles, or excuse me, journals, right, because we have many articles per journal, but those top 20 journals might not be as good quality as the end, and we might see a differential effect there. So that, yeah, and, and also the extent to which Elsevier as a publisher dominates the, the chemistry uh, uh, publication space, which I, I'm just not familiar with. Yeah, yeah, so that's a good question. I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to exactly how far down go. I mean, one of the pieces of analysis we're doing, but I just haven't haven't finished yet is to actually break that up and say, let's look at the top 10 versus the next 10 to, to try and get at that question. Um, I think the second, the first point you raised is this question about, well, the six month horizon, right? Like it, certainly it is definitely the case that in chemistry, as in you know, most fields, your overall research project is well more than that time period, right? So certainly. So I think what that suggests is that it, it, it is not that it's like totally shaping your research portfolio, right? And I, you know, I think I completely agree with that as a conclusion from then. I don't think it's quite, I wouldn't go as far as you did though in saying, well, it's just like the words you use to talk about your research, right? Because I mean, a big part of what we do when we write up our articles is we try and connect them to the literature. We try and say, this is important to this other thing. This is important to this. Here is how I synthesize this with some of the other work that's been done, right? And that's not, I mean, that still has a lot of scientific value. Right? Th thankfully for the professors who uh, are the ones often writing those sections. Uh, but yeah, so I, I think that, like, that, that part actually, and so that I think certainly could be influenced by this. And in fact, we've talked with some people in chemistry who've said, you know, given their, their publication cycles are actually pretty short, and so it definitely could be influencing that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. that you looked at what's the turnaround for submitting uh, because, for example, in my field, it takes probably eight months. So uh, from the time I submitted, not even I wrote the manuscript. Right. So I was just interested in checking that. Yeah, so we didn't ask the journals. We asked actual chemists. We just said, like, what's, what is your experience? Because when, one of my grad students on this, had a, she had a, a background in chemistry, so she went to other people are doing it. And she was saying it's about two to four months is the publication cycle from when you first hand it in to. And so we could definitely get an effect in this time period. Um, but it's, I mean, it is, there's no question, it is a short time period, and that's, um, I mean, we're doing that because we didn't really talk about this very much, but if you look at the scientific, there's just a lot of drift, okay? So you can, the words that are actually used in science, if you just pick a random set of words and look at how they evolve over time, like you see that certain words go out of fashion, other words come into fashion, right? All the results I've shown you, we've taken that into account, 
So we've adjusted for it, but it certainly is the case that if you were to go like three years later, um, then, I mean, you'd expect more drift. The second thing is also just uh, timing. We just haven't had, like if we wanted to do a, like a four-year window, which might, you know, might be interesting for a bunch of things, these articles haven't been up for long enough to do that. So, yeah. Okay. All right, so let's do this one, one last exercise here about cost effectiveness, okay? And I, precisely, I'm gonna come back to the point we, ju we just brought up, which is I don't wanna equate these as saying, like writing a Wikipedia article, which might influence the words used or the shape of what your argument is not the same as creating those words in the first place, okay? And I, I, I wanna, I'm gonna make that point again, but I want it to be super, super clear, okay? But I nevertheless think this is a valuable exercise. So if you take an NIH grant, a typical NIH grant is about um, $500,000, lasts for four, four and a half years, so uh, about $110,000 a year. Okay, and I made an assumption here, I'm not sure if this is a good assumption, but you'll see it won't matter very much, that if you do that, you get about point, half a paper a year, right? So it takes about two years to write a paper in this field, okay? Um, so, you know, immediately you could take these two numbers and say, well, okay, to produce a paper costs $220,000, divide by the number of words that are in that article, and you would get a cost per word. Okay, now, you know, a couple of things. I mean, first of all, you might say, well, boy, like, you're buying a lot more when you get that grant than just, like, a count of words, right? Okay, so for, let, let's make a, you know, assumption that only 10% of all of the value of that grant is embedded in those words. Because, you know, let's be clear, those words do have value. There are lots of people who will only ever find out about your science from the words that are in your article, right? And so, society, there's a lot of value in getting good words there. Okay, so you do this calculation and you get to $5.60 per word for a typical chemistry article, okay? We pay a lot per word in chemistry, okay? Um, okay, great. So now we say, okay, now let's think about Wikipedia. So. Uh, I pay these PhD students $100 an article to write these articles, okay? We saw this average effect, this causal effect of 0.3%. Again, you, you know, multiply it by the number of words, number of articles, okay? And then I'm gonna assume, now I have to make this assumption about what's the value in changing a word as opposed to the value in creating the word in the first place, okay? And so I'm gonna just assume that this is gonna be 10, only 10% 10 of that value. You only get 10% of the value from changing a word that you would do for creating in the first place. You'll see this could be 1%, it's still not gonna affect the answer. Okay, you do that calculation, okay, and you get three-tenths of, of a cent per word. Okay, and this is, remember, this is, you know, this is the effect of the, on the scientific literature. Okay, so look, there's, you know, this is a thousand times as cost effective. Now these are not quite the same things, right? I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna come back to that because I know, I'm sure some of you are wincing on the inside and like, why are you doing this comparison, right? The reason I'm doing this comparison is because we provide, all, like Wikipedia, what my research has shown here, right, is that Wikipedia is a platform that is of a lot of value to scientists. They absolutely use it, they go to it, and it influences how they write about things. What that means is if you do a better job of creating Wikipedia as a platform that is useful to scientists, you will get better science, right? And so, and this is saying, this calculation is showing you, look, it's incredibly cost effective. It, we absolutely should be funding the creation of public information. I mean, it could be Wikipedia or it could be some other source, but like giving that information away publicly in a, in a way provides much greater benefit, right? In terms of at least a cost per word and so, what this is saying is like there is just a lot of value in investing in these platforms for public information for scientists. Okay, all right, so what did I tell you today? First thing I told you is that Wikipedia is a major repository for science. Okay, so there's one Wikipedia article for about every 120 uh, scientific articles, and the coverage, at least in chemistry, covers something like 93% of all undergrad articles and 47% of all grad ones that we were able to look up. And that Wikipedia not only reflects science, but it shapes science. So adding an article in Wikipedia moves the related literature 0.3% closer to it in this sort of documents cosine similarity space. And that that's one third of the observational effect. The effect is stronger for those uh, scientists who had less access to journals, at least by measured by the sort of GDP of their country. And the, it's a cost effective public good for science. Okay, questions? 
please. So it's like uh, pure math, where typically before publication of a journal, the article is posted on archive, which is a uh, really yeah. available resource. Would you ex you'd expect that there wouldn't be this kind of effect because anyone can read the articles without needing to access the journals? No, I wouldn't go that far. No, I, I would say that I wouldn't expect a sort of incremental bump up from um, co countries that are poorer getting an additional effect, right? Because that's saying like that access to science is still there. But I, coming back to you know the Darwin quote at the beginning, I actually think that there's a lot of value, not just in the sort of openly accessible part, which you're saying that would be the same, but actually in the sort of like be very, very readable, very connecting to the other literature, like. Wikipedia articles are, in general, just more accessible than the underlying article, scientific articles that they write about. And so I think that there would still be a difference there. How much of this effect, I don't know, would fall into that. Yeah? Related to the question, but um, uh, more of a policy question. So I completely buy that cost effectiveness of Wikipedia is much greater than say, an NIH grant, there are lots of examples of tools, of, of, of things of this sort, where it, you, you said at the beginning that tools and infrastructure have bigger payoff than, say, the marginal study that you do. Good example is ARCA, which yeah, is extremely low cost, and yet has had tremendous problems uh, getting um, uh, sustained funding from, say, NSF or other uh, Absolutely. federal funders. So uh, another example would be open educational resources in chemistry or econometrics or whatever it is. Big, big bang for the buck. Any thoughts on how we might figure out <laughs> how to get this stuff funded since it's so much more cost effective than uh, just a, you know another grant? Yeah. So I so the, I mean so the short answer is you know the best contribution I think that that I I can I, I can make at the moment. Right, I guess, I guess twofold. I mean, one is just to really highlight with really good empirical studies like how important this is, right? Like, to my knowledge, no one has ever done a randomized experiment like this on these kind of platforms where you can say, no, it's not just that it's correlated, right? Everyone's going to believe that it's correlated because it's founded by this. But you can actually say, no, causally, this helps scientists. That's, so that's, you know, I think, I think part of what um, we can do with this. Um, the other thing is also just, like contributing to it. So uh, we didn't talk about this, but I'm just uh, starting some work right now where we're trying to create a much deeper resource on algorithms than Wikipedia has. Because you know, my experience is when computer scientists want to go to algorithms, they don't want to just see like the high level. Sometimes they want to see implementations. They want to see like links back to the underlying articles, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're, we're trying to build that kind of resource. But it, it's a really deep problem. I mean, back. You know, 1954, Samuelson, an economist, comes out and he says, look, this is a fundamentally hard problem because the thing about basic science is it has, is it has these very wide spillovers, right? The benefits of archive are incredibly diffuse. And that creates a problem because it's, you cannot, it's very, very hard to collect small amounts of money from lots and lots of people, particularly because you know, if it's open, they say, well, you know, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll donate tomorrow. Right? And so it's just it's an incredibly deep problem. I mean, it, I think in some sense you might argue that the, the reason we get closed access journals at all is because at least they can capture some of that money. But it's, it's a very, very difficult problem. I don't have a good answer yet. That's true of the, this public good problem, that's true of the studies also. But we don't seem to have any trouble, <laughs> this, cur this current administration notwithstanding, <laughs> funding you know, studies, but this infrastructure stuff. It's almost baked into the funders that they just won't touch them. You know, sustained funding for infrastructure, like archive or you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's. I mean, so I, I, I don't think I agree with that completely. I mean, certainly, if you look within the NIH, there are activities that they're doing where they're providing. So there's like the mutant mouse regional resource centers, for example, which is like. So it turns out that. For a lot of the uh, testing we want to do on drugs, there are specific mice that have been genetically engineered to have a susceptibility to something that makes them useful for testing. But it, it's just incredibly hard and expensive to maintain like 200 different labs, each of which have some mice. And so they've focused these things. Right? And, they, and there is funding for those kind of things. But 
would I argue that it's underfunded? Yes. I mean, that whole stream of my research is basically, you know, being able to say precisely that and saying, like, yes, we are significantly underfunding these things. I, I wish I had a better answer for you. Yeah, Marco. So this is a little bit stream of consciousness, but and, and, and just suggesting more work for you. But you know, at the end of an NSF grant, one has to write their summary report, which becomes a public document that is, you know, on some NSF website somewhere. And I'm going to make a hypothesis that its impact on the scientific literature is way, way less than what you've measured. But yeah. you probably have the information. The information is all publicly available to actually run that experiment. And then there's a proposal to NSF, which is you're not getting the bang for your buck by putting it on your website. You should actually make it a requirement that they write Wikipedia articles. Right. So, so this is something I've thought about. And, and I, so let me, um, you know, I brought this up to some Wikipedians, and they really hate the idea of this like being like the government mandating that people have to write articles because I think they'll get you know some drunk and stuff. But I, I, my conclusion is the same as yours, right? Like I think that it's um, that for the funding agencies. These results suggest you absolutely want to push scientists to say like if you're doing this kind of research and we want you to share it with the world, you have to write it. You know, just have like. Summarize the key results. Put a couple of links to the useful things in the right pages. But you know, if we have tens of thousands of scientists doing that every year, we very quickly get to a much re richer resource for science. I totally agree. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that writing, like changing the words that you use, isn't necessarily the same as creating the words themselves. Um, I suppose my question is, what if you did create? new words, and maybe there is or isn't, depending on the field, a way to quantify whether a change is better or worse, or is, promotes the field or hurts it, but my, I'm wondering, maybe scientists may be uniquely qualified to identify things that are beneficial to their field and make a change, if they see something on Wikipedia that seems like a good idea, they'll incorporate it. But say the average person who goes to Wikipedia sees something, it may or may not necessarily be a positive or negative change. Do you think they'd be more or less likely to show that same effect in changing their language? Okay, I, so let me, I, I, I got the first part of that, and maybe it, I'll, I'll try and answer. And um, so the, I think a big part of this question is like, okay, we're modifying these words, right? Is that is that a good thing, right? Is it like, do, do we think that that's a positive thing? And I, I think, to, to your to your point, I do think that scientists are you know reasonably well equipped to do this, right? Like, I mean, I, I have definitely read stuff on Wikipedia, and I'm like, no, that's that's not the right encapsulation of that idea, right? So I, I think scientists do have some ability to do that. Now, um, we don't yet have any evidence. We're actually doing a little work right now where we're hoping to be able to get at a little bit of that, um, but I don't think we have any, any strong evidence one way or another. Now, did I answer your whole question? Okay, you, you can ask it. Okay. How much do you speak uh, clear and transparent? I'm not very convinced with your argument. I, I agree with your broader argument that having public informational goods is, has significant impact on scientific work. I, yep. I take it you know, on face value. But in terms of the study, uh, uh, my concern is that it is very amazing, sexy topic, and I believe someone at Congress next day, uh, because they want to cut funding, going to take the back of your envelope analysis and turn it around the head so that why do we give $30 billion to NIH? We can just um, publish some Wikipedia articles. And I think that's kind of comparison between apples and oranges. Uh, so I'm very mindful about that impact. And I highly suggest that if you have someone at um, MIT SDS science technology study people have a conversa conversation with that. And my concern about the study is that in the science So let, let me make sure I understand. So yeah. you, like, there, there's the overall finding. Are you content? You, I mean, I, I think so you're taking issue with the cost effectiveness you know, calculation. I, I buy it vegan really okay. regardless of the okay. study. Yeah. But that um, comparison towards the end, I think. Um, okay, so, so right. And so, and so you can tell. I mean, I, I have some nervousness about this as well, which is why I, you know, several times. Right? But. But, but let me, let me ask you. you. Forbes pick this up yep. and publish something. Next day, someone on Congress is going to say that we have to cut $6 billion from NIH. Just publish like 100 Wikipedia article that fill in. We, we are living okay. in so, that so atmosphere. Me, so no, so I, I, I mean, like, I, I agree. And so let me, ask, let me ask the group, let me, as a source. So, I mean, you know, what I want to do is I want to be able to make a comparison, right, that just says, like, look how cost effective this is. 
right? Because it's like there is so, such underfunding of these kind of platforms, right? So, I because I have that same nervousness. Like I, I don't want to say like on the science side, like we need more science funding, not less, right? I'm just saying we need more science funding, but we also need a bunch of this. So what's another comparison we could make that is not going to have that drawback, but is uh, that could be taken the wrong way, but it's still going to be useful. I don't know. So. So I think this is actually a really important question because people have been known to misinterpret data and use it in bad ways. Indeed. So, so, so here's a way to think about it. I don't know, I have all the way to the answer, which is that the scientific articles that are produced from the NIH grants are primary sources. Exactly. And Wikipedia is a secondary source. For sure. Wikipedia so the question is, is, where are the secondary sources in chemistry? would be the right question to ask. And, and I don't know the answer, but you could imagine, you know, New York Times articles, Washington, you know, so, so there are newspaper articles that are sometimes about the latest breakthroughs in science. There are, um, you know, in computer science, you might have sort of more popular magazines. And so, so maybe if there's a, if we can figure out an area where there's a, a big enough corpus and I'm actually thinking tech and computer science might be the right place, and a sufficiently large secondary market, right? Secondary source market, that would give you the better comparison, I think. Wouldn't something like Stack Overflow actually be a better, I'm, I'm not joking, right? Because that's a considered a resource as well, or something like so the Stack Stanford. Overflow is a great example that is very similar to Wikipedia. Right, but in that second order, because if you looked at something like I, I would struggle to understand what the use case of the people coming to something mm -hmm. similar to, to Wikipedia as well, because that's pretty that would be pretty important. That's how some of the effects happen, right. is that people can easily access and stumble <coughs> upon this stuff. So I, I, it would be really interesting to find another area where you could do this. Another one that comes to mind is like uh, philosophy, because there's good secondary material on a lot of philosophical work, because the work itself is so damn inaccessible. And you could have something like the Stanford um, uh, Encyclopedia of Philosophy or something like that. Because right. you need that interesting, similar use case. But, but I think there's another piece that we need, right? So we need not just that, like, like Stack Overflow, yes, it's a good, important secondary source, right? But it isn't government funded, right? Like, what, what I mean, the, the point we want to contrast here is we want to say, like, like gov I mean, governments, like, so I, if I were to look at the cost effectiveness compared to Stack Overflow, I think I'd find about the same kind of thing because Stack Overflow is a really useful source, but that's not, but in some sense that's not the point. The point is to say, like, we, it is worth investing more money in X, and you can see that by contrast to something that you are already funding, which suggests that it is so, worth funding. So then it's, it's trying to get the internal cost of running you know, the, it's not a preprint server, but right, the summary report server at NSF or NIH, right? NIH, I'm sure, makes, has to make public by mandate all the findings from their research. And so in some sense, it's like teasing that apart and figuring out how much that costs. Yeah, yeah I found that cost-effective slide pretty problematic because like, it's not like people are just coming up with facts about molecules. They, you know, like, and then being like, oh, well, I can write this one. Like, Clearly, the reason that people even have any of that knowledge at all required, at least in chemistry, some sort of physical apparatus that was not going to be just no, no, de and democratically. Uh, no, no, so I, I totally buy that. But I also don't, I, like, I, I don't buy the argument that these are completely in, in comparable things, right? Because actually, like, you know, science that happens and never gets out in the world, right? Like has much less value than science that that's get out get, gets out in the world, and so that influence has an effect. But I agree with you that like there's no sense in which I could say like let's take all of the NIH funding, let's give it all to Wikipedia, and I'm still going to get a whole bunch of new chemistry, right, or new, new biology. No, I'm not going to because I like I have to have that underlying source, right, and that's so I I totally agree with that part of it. You don't look convinced. I'm not convinced. Okay. Oh, well, so, 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 I mean, so what, what part of that, like, I mean, you're I mean, saying that the, you know, the, the ultimate per, engine has to be science, well, right? Well, also, cost per words. I'm not convinced by cost per words. And maybe you're just saying, you know, you're saying, like, yeah, the words are different, but we're still going to compare this metric, which is cost per words. And I'm, I'm not particularly convinced by that. Okay. You don't even, like, 
one percent of the effect of the one percent of the value of the word. I mean, I don't. Okay. No, no, that's, I, I, I mean, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm asking because it's like, you know, ultimately, I want to be able to make an argument that says society should invest more in this. And so I, I'm, I actually am just interested in, like, what, what people find compelling or not compelling about saying we should do more of this. Yeah. I was in Boston by a slide because my Reddit is, you know, the National Institute of Health has a thousand times the, the impact per word as Wikipedia. So because of the originality of your work, they're worth paying down the time. So because of that, I guess if you can work the slide that way, then no one misinterpreted what you think of. Or yet another way, an extremely small addition of funding increases its impact. I mean, that's really what you want to say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Is, that, is that you don't want to be passing a value judgment on the original work, and you, don't, you want to be saying that an exceptionally small additional investment um, increases the impact in a meaningful way. You have to put That's a communication really plan in your grant, and I think what Mario said, that makes sense, that make sure that should be communicated to public in an accessible way, and examples can be, for example, written quality, high quality Wikipedia articles. Right, that can become a, a, a way of communicating the finding to the public. Actually, I like this idea. Think of it as a tax, right? How much would we have to tax NIH research to broaden the impact significantly? And it turns out that it's, you know, tiny fractions of a penny, right? If, we, if every NIH grant came with an additional, you know, communication tax to fund a graduate student to spend, you know, to, to write a Wikipedia article, Right, that's a teeny addition. It's an addition to the NIH budget right. in that's, service of this. That's yes. really great. I like that's, that a lot. Yeah, yeah yes. that's really your idea, and I think that's the way to look at that's it. Great. So it's not so much a comparison; it's how much tax would we have to put on it. Yep. No, I really like that's that. That's really good. Or, or even more, if you say, "Okay, we're going to have a zero-sum game. We're not going to add any more money." What would what would we actually be losing right. by by forcing someone to do this communication work? And the answer is probably basically not zero. Yeah. Right. Okay, I really like that. Great. Other questions? Yeah. Do you think there is a qualitative difference between like a platform like Wikipedia versus like surveys and expository articles that experts in the field already write? Well, although like not very well funded either. <laughs> uh, I do. Yes, I do think that there's a difference, and I think that uh, there are a couple of differences. So one is that by its nature, Wikipedia is constantly being updated, right? And so someone can write a really definitive like review of the literature, but of course, 10 years later, like there's been a whole bunch of stuff. And so you, in some sense, like as long as those are standalone things, you, you have this problem that they can get out of date. Whereas the nice thing about Wikipedia is if you embedded that in Wikipedia, then you could make small changes over time to keep it up to date. And so I think, I think that's one aspect. The other thing is also that I think because of the number of people who look at it and um, the ability to edit it, in general, Wikipedia is easier to read than most academic articles. And I think that, that actually that accessibility is really valuable as well. Accessibility also could be measured in different ways too. Like uh, Wikipedia is very often the top Google, uh, the top result in Google. Yep. And in fact, Google summarizes from Wikipedia articles as well. So you don't even have to click anything <laughs> to understand what you're seeing. And so again, if you go back to the use case of the human being sitting in the chair, uh, this being my point actually about Stack Overflow, like yeah, you could have an amazing review article uh, you could have a great piece of journalism that's even, you know, in the New York Times where you get your first 10 articles free. Um, and so it is nominally free, but it has nowhere near the impact because of the pervasiveness and the availability of Wikipedia. It's but, just there. But there's, there's one slight difference that we don't want to lose sight of, which is that Wikipedia is mostly poll-based and that I get to Wikipedia because I asked a question. Yes. And some of these yeah. other outlets are a little more push-based, which is because I'm interested in a general topic, I get it pushed in front of me. And so there's a slight kind difference of. there, and we wouldn't want to replace one with the other, even though, you know. The, uh, what's interesting there is the idea of a general topic. Yeah. Because increasingly, like, what is general? Fair enough. But, yes. I, and you could imagine, I mean, maybe this already exists in, in one of the corners of Wikipedia I don't know about, but you could also imagine a thing that says, like, uh, they recognize what is advanced chemistry, and you get a push when... There's all the changes. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's a fun... Oh, there's another project we should do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we should thank okay. Neil and let him go. <laughs> thank you all very much. <laughs>